All right, uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, my name's Jeff, I'm the lead pastor here. Glad you're joining us here this morning. Uh, this is a special Sunday because we are doing baby dedications or child dedications today, uh, and that's really exciting. I'll explain more of what that means a little bit later on, but first, uh, if you're a first time guest here today and you didn't receive your guest gift when you first came in, uh, one of the ways you can receive it is by texting the word new to the number up there on the screen. Uh, we'll send you a link back in response to your text with a form. Fill that out. Show our volunteer down at Connect Central that you've completed it, and we'll give you a gift on your way out just as a way of saying thank you for joining us today. Uh, also, if you haven't already done so, you can follow us on social media. Uh, we're on Instagram as well as on Facebook, and we're currently live on Facebook as well. So good morning to everybody on the live stream. Uh, for those of you that are in-house, uh, feel free to take out your phone at any time and share that live stream. We've been amazed at how people have responded to that. There have been people who have come to movement specifically after watching the live stream for a while, and so sharing it is widely encouraged, and so I just want to encourage you to do that. Uh, we're going to get ready to go into a time of worship here. Uh, some of you maybe are not Christians, or maybe you haven't been to church in a while. Uh, we think of worship as just singing, uh, but it's really more than that. What worship is, is it's reflecting God's worth back to him and showing that we believe that he's worthy. And one of the ways that we do it through sing is through singing. Uh, and so I wanna encourage you to just kinda let these uh, lyrics bubble up in your hearts to go beyond just your lips, but to really sing from your hearts this morning. And so I wanna invite you to stand. Let's get ready to sing together. out together church remember those walls remember those walls that we caught sin and shame they were like prisons that we couldn't escape but he came and he died and he rose those walls are up Remember those giants we called death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear, here we go. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit, he did. He did, who paid for all of our sins, nobody but Jesus, who pulled me out of that pit. He did, he did, who paid for all of our sins, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, 
Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Him, this is our God, this is who He is. He loves us, this is our God, this is what He does. He saves us for the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. For the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus.
will not be anxious. Jesus, you are near. The peace of God surrounding me is casting out all fear. that holds the heaven is the mighty hand that saves the voice that calms the stormy seas is calling me by name I'm singing in the victory the victory of the cross Resting in the shadows of your redeeming love, I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life, cause I am yours forever, and Jesus, you are mine, oh Jesus, you are mine. Church. And I'm singing in the victory. 
victory, the victory of the cross, resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life, because I am yours forever. In Jesus, you are mine. Oh, Jesus, you are mine. I don't know if some of you realize the full weight of those words. And by weight, I mean kind of the opposite, actually. Um, the scriptures teach over and over again that um, the person that can have peace and rest in their life isn't the person that works the hardest but the person who trusts that the finished work is done by Jesus Christ and not by ourselves. And so it's, it's this idea that real peace, um, you know, doesn't come from us trying to earn our connection with God or, or anything like that. Rather, it comes from accepting the fact that, that, that we are broken, but that Jesus is so good that he can rebuild that bridge between the two of us. And that's good news. And so that's what we're celebrating here today. So let's take a minute and let's just pray together and just thank God for this. Uh, Father, we come to you right now and we just thank you for the cross where the, the ugliness of sin became visible and the greatness of your love became visible at the same time. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Because God, what we need really, more than almost any other thing, is the peace that comes from hope that can't be taken away from us. And many of us have searched and searched and searched and tried and tried and tried, and we've never found it in anything other than you. In fact, your word says that we won't. And so, Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you that, that when we grow tired of searching, we can find ourselves in you and you just accept us back with open arms. That you love us and forgive us and give us grace and peace that we can't find anywhere else. Lord Jesus, I pray that if there's anybody here this morning or listening online that is without that peace today, I pray that today that they would know you and that they would experience it for themselves. I pray that anybody that's here that has tasted that peace but has somehow lost focus on you and, and the eternity that you promise and the good things that you have for them, I pray that, that you would refill them with hope and joy and peace today. I pray that you would bless us this morning with your presence and an awareness of your presence. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for being with us and hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. We are going to jump right into our child dedications today. And so if you parents and children want to come out, now's the time. Uh, we were supposed to have three today. We might actually have to post, post, uh, postpone one until next week because uh, there was a sickness that... Uh, that needed to be tended to, but we're excited to have these folks today. So give it up for everybody up here on the stage really quick. So um, I'm going to introduce these folks to you, and then I'll explain to you briefly sort of what we're doing in dedications and what it means, and then uh, we're going to present them with some certificates and uh, kind of call them to a commitment and challenge you as well. Uh, so really quickly, uh, this is Connor and Ashlyn, and this is little Beckham. Um, Many of you uh, know these folks because Connor is leading the exchange, our student ministry. Ashlyn is leading our kid zone. And so they are the next gen power couple of Movement Church. Uh, and so we're grateful for them. And then this is Amy and Elliot and Elliot Jr., who we're going to call EJ for today. Everybody give it up for them. And. Uh, They've been a part of our church for a while and really kind of jumped in head first, and we're excited that they're taking this step in child dedication today. Um, and so let me just take a minute and kind of briefly explain what it is. Child dedication is something that we see in a few places sort of in the scriptures. So you see this with 
Hannah, who was a woman who prayed and prayed and prayed that God would give her a child after she wasn't able to have a child for a long time. And when God gave her the child, her response was not to say mine, but rather was to say, God, you bless me with this baby. I'm going to give this child back to you. And then that baby was then later known as Samuel, uh, who became one of the great prophets in ancient Israel's history, who anointed King David as the king over Israel and did many, many amazing things. Um, This isn't exactly the same thing, because what you're not doing is you're not giving me your kid and saying, raise him, and he can belong to the church. We're not doing that, just to be clear. Um, uh, but, But what we're doing today is we're essentially saying something similar in that these parents are saying, we want to recognize that this child is a gift from God, but, but more importantly, that this isn't our child, this is God's. And that he, he created, and this is an illustration of what we're like, right? Um, but, but the point is, is that God, if you're a parent, God has not given you that child to raise in your own likeness and image as you please. Did you know that? The point is that you are a steward. Just, just let him go, it's all good. He does what he wants, it's awesome. I knew you were going to stay there. The, but, the point of, but the point of it is, is that we as parents are stewards. What, what that means essentially is that the, our kids are given to us to raise in a way that reflects the goodness of God and we're to raise them in a way that honors God so that we lead them not just to Christ, but Christ-likeness. In other words, discipleship is something that starts in the home first and foremost, And so these parents here today are committing to raise their kids in that way. Now, this is different from baptism a lot. Go ahead and clap for that. That's a good idea. Because it's an important, it's a a big commitment. It's an important commitment. And it's one really that as parents we're all supposed to make as Christians. Um, One of the things I want to make clear, though, is that it's not the same as child baptism. Um, For those of you that don't know, in Movement Church, we don't believe in child baptism because in Scripture we see that people get baptized after they put their faith in Christ. And so what we're committing to today is that the parents will raise their kids in such a way that they point them constantly to Jesus with the hope that down the line their kids will take that step of faith. You tracking with me? And so today, that's the parents' part. Our role in this, however is that we as a church, as the body of Christ, are called to support not only the kids in this through Kid Zone and through other opportunities that will come down the line to encourage their kids toward Christ, but to support these parents as well. If you see them struggling or if they have questions and are seeking wisdom, we as a church family are called to support them in whatever way uh, seems appropriate at the time and especially whenever they come seeking help. And so there's a commitment on our end as well. And so that's what we're doing today with dedication. Yep, I'm glad you're excited about that because I'm going to call on you here in just a moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, read just a a short statement, and this is sort of what your commitment is uh, to your child. And then after I read it to you, just kind of collectively, you can say, we do. Okay? Cool. All right, so here is your commitment as parents. We commit to do everything within our power to raise this child in a godly way until he can make the decision for Christ on his own. We promise to partner together to example Jesus consistently, discipline biblically, and pray earnestly for our child. Do you agree? All right. Church, yours is going to be a little less formal because I'm not giving you a certificate. All right. (laughs) Do you agree to support both the parents and the children in their pursuit of this godly life for their children. Say, we do. We do. All right, give it up, everybody. Now, I'm going to present you with these certificates. Now, ironically, Ashlyn, you get to sign your own kid zone. Uh, as the kid zone director, you get to sign your own certificate. Um, and then, parents, there's a line for you to sign that as well. And that's something that you can keep and put it in a place where you're going to be reminded of it often. Uh, and then we have a couple of gifts for each of you. Um, This is for EJ. There's some books in there. I believe there's a Bible in there. And and we're just grateful for these parents. So now what we're going to do collectively together is we're just going to take a few minutes uh, and we're going to pray for them. And so if you could just bow your head, close your eyes, and I'm just going to pray over you guys. Father God, I just thank you so much for these parents and their decision today to dedicate their child. And really, it's a dedication and a commitment on their end. Um, They are deciding 
to give their child the very best that this universe has to offer, and that is you. They're, they're dedicating themselves to raising their children in such a way that everything they do points to, to you, Lord. I pray that when they make mistakes, that they would own them quickly in their parenting, that they would even apologize to their own children when necessary, and that when their kids look at them, they don't just see people who talk about Jesus and who talk about the ways of God, but who example them to the best of their ability. God, we know that nobody's perfect, but we know that your Holy Spirit can guide these children into a relationship with you that begins on this earth but lasts for eternity. And God, I pray that starting here and beyond, that there would just be generations that would follow of these families that know and love and pursue you. I pray that we as a church family would be faithful in our end of the commitment. God, that we would strive to support these families in their commitment to their children, that we would bless the kids with everything that we do here, and that we too would point them to you getting ourselves out of the way and making you of the utmost importance in this church and in their lives. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of these kids. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, give it up one more time, everybody. Thank you, guys. All right, so while I'm getting set up, we're gonna do what we do each Sunday. This might make some of you uncomfortable, and that's okay, because we're here to get uncomfortable, all right? So stand up, say hi to a couple people, greet them, and say good morning. Introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. Morning. All right, well done. All right, a couple of announcements real quick uh, before we dive into the message for today. Uh, The first one is we have an evangelism training Uh, It's not an event, it's a course that is starting this Friday, March 1st. How is it March already? It's starting this Friday, March 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, This is a multiple week course uh, that's going to be taking place every other week. It is an eight session commitment, each of them about two hours and includes homework. So this this is not something where if you're just sort of vaguely interested in learning how to evangelize, Uh, You're going to show up once and just kind of fizzle out. This is something that's going to require some real commitment, but with real commitment comes real change. Amen? That's a word right there. We could stop. That's a whole sermon, right? When you really, really commit to something good and dedicate yourself to it, you can grow in that thing. And so for those of you that are going to be a part of this, it's going to really bless you. There's only 15 total spots available. And so if you haven't registered for that, today's your opportunity. Make sure you stop by Connect Central on the way out. And again, this is a, this is a free event uh, or free training, rather. So don't feel like uh, you can't be a part. If you've got the time and the dedication, you can be a part of this. So that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, we have a worship night coming up on Saturday, March 2nd. We're very excited about this. Um, we like to sing. We don't always do it well but we like to sing. The worship team does it well, and thank God for that. Amen. They're awesome. Um, And so movement worship team is going to be leading. Uh, Discover Church out in Wadsworth is going to be leading, and Lydia Joy is going to be joining us as well. And you might have to hear from me for about four or five minutes as well, so hopefully that doesn't turn you off. But it's a free event. We would love to see you here. That's happening Saturday, March 2nd uh, in the evening, so make sure you're planning on being here for that. Uh, You can Register for that uh, if you'd like to by clicking going on our event page on Facebook, or you can just simply show up, uh, but make sure you invite some friends because it's going to be a really cool thing. Next, uh, we've got a new series that's starting next week. This is the last week of our Rebuild series, uh, and our new uh, series next week is called It's a Trap. Uh, If you ever played Star Fox back in the day, you know the reference, but if you didn't, that's okay because I'll explain it to you now. Um, So if you look through the Gospels, Uh, you see that over and over again that Jesus' enemies tried to trap him in order to either arrest him or have him killed. And over and over and over again, because he's the perfect son of God and he knows the exact right answer for every single problem we may face, he gave the exact, precise, perfect answer uh, 
to them in response. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at each of the times that the Pharisees tried to trip Jesus up or trap him in something he might say and his response and how it affects us. Because there's some really, really deep, good truths in those things. It's going to be awesome. So make sure you're here next week for that. It's a trap. Maybe I'll stick my finger in a mouse trap to promote it. I don't know. It'll be fun. We'll figure something out. I'm not doing that. I'm just kidding. Um, Lastly is giving. Uh, If you have an offering to give today, there's a couple ways that you can give. Uh, If you're a paper or plastic money person, you can give back at the cafe when we're all done. If you like to give digitally through your phone, uh, you can do that through the Tithely app, which you can download in the App Store or movementchurch.com slash give. Um, One of the reasons, and perhaps the most important reason that we give as a church family, uh, is because we, we serve and live for a generous God who gave everything for us. Many of you know this scripture. This is sort of the gospel, the good news of Jesus in a nutshell. It's John 3.16. It says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Um, you would be hard-pressed to say that you're like God if you're not a generous person. And one of the beauties of coming together as a church in our giving is that when we give here, we can pool all of our resources together to do something greater than we could do apart. And so that's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why we give. And for those of you that call Movement Church your home, I want to encourage you to give the best that you can. If you're here today, maybe for the first time, and you're like, oh, here we go, the giving thing. Fine, don't give. That's okay. I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I'm talking to uh, people who call movement their home, uh, but we do know that God is a generous God. Amen? All right. Glad we're on the same page. I want to pray one more time, uh, mainly because this is the last week of this series, and, um, and I want to make sure that I'm speaking God's word and that your hearts and ears are receptive, so let's take a moment to pray over the rest of this message. Father, um, I thank you for the privilege of worshiping you through preaching. And I pray that it would really be worship, that it wouldn't be my opinions uh, that are coming from my mouth, but I would just preach your word. And I pray that it would shine through in this. I pray that, that everybody here today, no matter where we're at in the faith journey, whether we've been a Christian for 50 years or we're not yet a Christian, and we're just here to check things out, or we're here because of the child dedications, whatever the case may be, I pray that you would open our hearts and ears up And help us to be receptive to what you have to say because we know that this is the word of God to us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you're joining us for the first time today, we've been in this series for the last seven weeks called Rebuild. And what we've been doing is looking at the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is this Old Testament book where basically we see God using this one man, Nehemiah, to lead the Jews in rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem. Uh, The walls had been torn down about 100 years later by the nation, uh, the empire of Babylon. They had been destroyed. And the problem with having a city with no walls in those days is the wall was your first line of defense against enemies. If you didn't have a city wall, uh, you were basically open to all kinds of attacks from uh, enemy nations, enemy tribes, whatever the case may be. You were in a vulnerable and disgraced place, and that is the place that Israel was in when Nehemiah came along and God called him to this project of rebuilding the wall around the city. Now, the theme of the series comes from the book of Psalms, and it's this. It's, it, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord does it, then everybody who's working on the project is, is doing it to no real valuable end. In other words, what this means is there are things that if you pursue them in your life without God being involved in them, you will either fail Or, even worse than that, you will succeed at something that will never last. You will spend a whole lot of time on something that will ultimately amount to nothing. And basically, this whole New Year series on rebuilding or building these things in our lives, uh, if you were to summarize it all in one piece, it is this. Cling to God in everything you do so that you don't waste your life. Make it worthwhile. By joining in with with what God is doing in this world and making sure that he's a part of of what it is that you're doing. Last week we talked about how they had succeeded in in building this wall and how they had this big worship ceremony 
where they dedicated the wall. They had these choirs walking on top of it in opposite directions uh, around the perimeter of the city, and they sang, and, um, and there was this big worship service, and it was this big happy event. Um, but this week, we're going to talk about something a little bit less happy. Many of you maybe can relate to this, um, and if not, I'll just speak for myself, and it works anyway. Um, we live really busy lives. My wife and I are both all over the place with work and ministry and being away. We've got a son who's eight years old, and he's in sports, and, and like it just feels sometimes like we don't have a moment to breathe. And as a result of that, what will happen sometimes is we'll be in such a rush that we'll start some sort of project at home, like some home project, or we'll make some sort of mess at home, and we'll have to abandon it before we can finish it. And so what will happen is, uh, at first, every time we come in the house, we'll recognize the mess. We'll see the unfinished project, and it'll bother us. But if you go long enough, and you just keep ignoring it, or you, or you don't have the time to address it, the longer it stretches out, the less you notice it as time goes on. You tracking with me? Some of you are like, I'm a neat freak. I have no idea what you're talking about. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. I'm not alone. So over and over again, you, you, you know the project is there, but because you get used to living with your mess, you see it less and less and less, even though it's still there. Until you invite somebody over to your house. And then all of a sudden, you don't just see that mess and that unfinished project, you see all of them at the same time. Like every individual dog hair suddenly is glowing and you can see it all. Why? Because you're starting to see your home through a fresh set of eyes from a fresh perspective as if you were the guest that's coming into your home. Well, this is what happened to Nehemiah in his day. So everything was good, uh, the wall was rebuilt, the temple was established, Nehemiah made sure that the people were following the law of God like they had committed to, they dedicated the wall, they celebrated everything. Well then, Nehemiah left. For about 12 years, he left. His term as governor ended. He went back to the king of Persia, who he had been serving under before. And then after 10 or 12 years, he returns. And when he returns, he discovers that all of the things that they had promised to do, they stopped doing them. All of the things. They had stopped being faithful to the things that they had been committed to when Nehemiah had left. And I can almost guarantee you that that didn't happen overnight. It's the same thing that you guys just agreed to that happens with your house. That it started with one little compromise or one little mess or one little thing that they ignored about the law of God. And then another, and then another, until finally they had distanced themselves from God and his ways entirely and they had just grown comfortable living in it. And it took a fresh set of eyes with Nehemiah coming from Persia to see what the problem really was. And he came in to clean house. And so today what we're going to talk about is what does that look like for us to clean house in our own lives? To stop ignoring the mess that we've created for ourselves, whether it's some sort of bad habit or temptation or sin that we've just kind of accepted, and to finally, finally, finally get up and do something about it. All right? So that's what we're talking about today. Let's see what Nehemiah did first. Uh, and it actually wasn't Nehemiah, this initial section. It starts in chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Uh, this actually came about just by simply reading the scriptures. It says, On that day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. I'll explain that in a moment. Because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Bal uh, Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. There's a message right there. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. You're like, what the heck is this? Let me give you just some quick context. Abraham, who was the first Jew, had a nephew named Lot. The Moabites and the Ammonites were descendants of Lot. 
when the Jews were rescued out of Egypt by God. You know that, that uh, Charlt- Charleston Heston movie, right? Um, how he led them out of Egypt. Moses leads them out of Egypt through the power of God. The Ammonites and the Moabites, rather than treating them well in the wilderness, making sure that they had food and water, treated them as enemies instead. This did not make God happy. To make things even worse, these enemies, now enemies, they actually tried to get a prophet to curse the people of Israel, and God intervened and said, "Uh uh-uh, you're going to bless them instead. And so God had determined that these peoples were not allowed to be permitted in this, the assembly, the same assembly with God's people, even though in some sense they were distant relatives. They were no longer allowed to be apart. And so this was something God had commanded clearly. The people in their ignorance didn't realize until they heard the word of God read, oh shoot, we're, they're hanging out with us right now. And so they say, you guys need to go. We need to be obedient to God. So the first thing, For you today, cleaning house begins with growing our self-awareness. It begins with growing our self-awareness. It wasn't until they saw in the law of God that they realized, oh shoot, we are the problem. We're doing the wrong thing. I'll give you an example, an embarrassing example of a time that I realized this for myself. Um, I've been married to my wife for 16 years now. And over the course of 16 years, you can occasionally find ways to irritate each other. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Husbands, if you say amen, she's going to slap you and you deserve it, right? But over the course of 16 years, uh, you, you learn how to irritate each other sometimes. And I remember this one particular time where my wife was copping an attitude. And I was like, yeah, right. They're like, she's so sweet. You don't see her. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but she was. She was copying an attitude. And I was really irritated about it. And it was something that had happened multiple times, I think in the same week or something. And it was just different than the normal way that she handled situations. And it really, really bothered me. I'm like, what's wrong with her? And then in the middle of sort of, you know, because we're really good at analyzing other people's problems and their faults. In the middle of analyzing her faults, God is like, uh, you know, like, she's imitating what you've been doing to her. <laughs> and, and, and what I realize, and this goes for you men in, in particular, is, is I do believe that scripturally speaking, that, that husbands are to be the head of their homes and to provide leadership in their homes. And what I had realized is that I had been leading her, but just the wrong way. That she literally was imitating my actions. And, and this, is, this is a true story. I didn't even talk to her about correcting it. I corrected my behavior. And as a result, hers changed as well. This is true. I don't, I don't even know if you knew this. Did you know this? I think I've talked about it before. But the reality is what I realized is that I needed to become more self-aware and God used somebody else to make it obvious to me. This is what the scriptures do for us. When we're reading these stories about other people's lives, we're not just supposed to learn what they did and what God did for them and through them in the past. Rather, we're supposed to hold these scriptures up as a mirror, looking our own selves in the face because what we see may not be real attractive all the time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> They're like, I'm attractive. I don't care what you say. Let me give you an example of this. In the Old Testament, David, the king of Israel, who slayed Goliath and defeated all these enemies and was a man after God's own heart, that same man also stole another man's wife and had the man killed. The woman's name was Bathsheba, and she was the, the wife of Uriah, and he had Uriah killed. And he felt no remorse. There was no indication that he was broken up over what he did at all. Until one day, this man named Nathan, who was a prophet, came with this word from God, and he said, David, I want to tell you a story. And David's like, cool, it's story time, let's go. And Nathan's like, all right, there was this man who was really rich, and he had all these sheep and cattle. And there was another man who was really poor, and all he could afford was this one little lamb. Female lamb, actually, he puts that in there just to you know, create the the full illustration. 
And he says, along came this, this traveler who came to visit the rich man, and the rich man said, well, I want to feed you because I know I'm supposed to, but I want to give you my stuff. And so he stole the sheep from the poor man, slaughtered it, and fed it to his guest. And David is just like filled with rage. He's like, that man deserves to die. Not only that, but he should pay back four times the cost of the lamb to the poor man for that horrible, wicked thing that he did. And you know what Nathan said? He said, you are the man. Nathan said, listen, this word is from the Lord, and what you are reading is not about somebody else. It is a mirror into your own soul. See, what we like in our culture is we like filters, right? We look in our phones, and we set up a filter. Why? Because we can make ourselves look pretty. In fact, let's be honest, you make yourself look like a whole different person, a much better looking person than you actually are. The scripture doesn't do that. The scripture shows you as you are. No smoke, no fun house mirrors, just as you are, warts and all. Now, the good news is this, as you are, is someone created in the image of God with dignity and value and worth. So that's a good thing. But on the flip side, it also shows us and makes us aware of our own shortcomings and reveals and points to us the solution to those shortcomings, which is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's the only place where we can find healing. Church, you need to wake up. I am going to lose my mind. Once we see the flaws, we have to act like the Israelites did, and we have to take action to remedy it. So we don't want to just see the warts. We want to do something about it. So cleaning house begins with growing in our self-awareness, which we do by becoming more familiar with the scriptures. Here's the next section, starting in verse 4. It says, Before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. Now let's pause here for a second. If you remember back to the earlier chapters of this series, uh, Tobiah was one of the great enemies of Israel at the time who was pushing and mocking and even preparing to go to war against Israel in order to stop them from building the wall. So here we find out that there is a priest in the house of God who has cleared out one of the rooms in the house of God for one of Israel's enemies to have an apartment in the house of God. You see how broken this is? This is what he's done. It says, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, Nehemiah says, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. By the way, for those of you that are maybe a little skeptical of the scriptures, a little skeptical of the Bible. One thing that's worth noting is these are historical figures we're dealing with, like noted historical figures that we're dealing with here. Um, And so you'll see that all throughout the scriptures that there are these familiar names of kings and leaders that you can connect the history of the Bible to. In the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had uh, returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God, and I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. You guys, some of you old, uh, older basketball fans, you remember Bob Knight from Indiana? You remember what that dude did? He'd get mad in the middle of a basketball game, and he'd grab a chair, and he'd drag it to the middle of the floor, and mm, chuck it into the middle of the basketball court. I can picture Nehemiah doing that, right? He sees that the enemy of God has built this apartment, and he just grabs some of his furniture, and he just mm, yoinks it right out into the middle of the room. He says, I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. Listen, I know this Old Testament stuff is unfamiliar, but it's really not if you take a pause. What has happened is this man, this priest, has taken things that were meant to be used for holy uses, the house of God, and he has taken a compartment of it, and he said, you know what? The rest of this place can be used for God, but this room can be used for our enemies. And if you're being honest with yourself, many of us Christians do the exact same thing with our lives. 
We say, God, I will give you this part of my life and this part of my life and this part of my life, and you can change it all you want, but don't touch this because this is mine. But the reality is Jesus did not die for most or part of your life. He died for all of it. He died for all of it. Here's the next point. Cleaning house means giving every part of your life to God. And so the question that you have to be honest with yourself, if we're becoming more self-aware, you have to be honest with yourself and you have to say, what part of my life am I withholding from God right now? What part of my life has the Holy Spirit tried to move and to change and I have just said no to the God who saved me, to the God who made me for his purposes? I listed three of them here because I think these are the big three. The first one is relationships. See it all the time. People say, God, I'll go to church. I'll, I'll do the things that you asked me to do ceremonially. I'll be kind to people. I'll be compassionate. I'll volunteer. I'll serve. But when it comes to my dating, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to my, uh, my sexual relationship with my partner, you don't have a say in this thing. And God says, I don't have a say. I made you. I saved you. I sustained you. I've created you for me. Have what I done for you is what I've done for you not enough? How about finances? And this goes in many, many, many different ways. Some of us, that room, that compartment that we're keeping from God is, is the fact that we're a workaholic and God has provided more than we need. And what he's actually called you to is to take a step back from work a little bit so that you can spend time with your family and raise your kids in the fear and the instruction of the Lord and be present when they're young. Or maybe, maybe financially he's called you to generosity, to, to recognize that, that I have more than enough and there's people in need and he's called me to share some of that with people in need. Maybe, you, maybe he's called you to sell some of what you have and to give to the poor. That's something that Jesus commanded. Maybe he's called you to do that. And he said, you know what, God, you can have all this other stuff, but don't ask me to do that. How about your time? That's the other big one. And you can see it. It's reflected on Sunday mornings. There's so many Christians who seem to have time for everything but gathering to worship with other believers. It's just something they say, God, don't touch that. We've got sports, we've got vacation, we've got whatever, and there's nothing wrong with taking time off. But when you're not committed, when it's not a priority for you, and God has clearly called you to it, what that tells me is you've set that part aside of your life and you've said, God, don't touch this. Jesus did not give his whole self so that you would live partially or even mostly for him. He expects the same in return. So cleaning house means giving every part of your life to God. Here's the next one, starting in verse 10. Nehemiah says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields, Pause for a second. So for those of you that weren't here last week, the Levites were the tribe of Israel where the priests came from. You could not be a priest in Israel unless you were a Levite. Even if you weren't a priest, the Levites were put in charge of taking care of the temple and making sure that worship was happening. Why? Because worship was to be happening to God all the time, and the people needed others to lead them in that worship and making sacrifices, and making sure uh, that, that all the steps were taken properly in worship, teaching the people the law of God, that sort of thing. So the Levites are extremely important to worship in Israel, and instead of being in the church or the temple, what are they doing? They're out in the fields working. They're out, they're out farming. So he sees that this has happened. Why? Because the, the, the tithes that were supposed to be brought in had not been brought in. And so what does Nehemiah do? He says, so I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? 
Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storeroom. So Nehemiah immediately is fixing the problem. He says, I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, sound of Zik- I can't even pronounce any of this, son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant. Why? Because they were considered trustworthy. So he rebukes the leaders. He demands that the grain and all the oil and all the things that are supposed to be brought in be brought in. And then he appoints trustworthy people to oversee and manage these resources. He says they were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. And then he says, remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its uh, its services. The next thing that you need to realize today, the, the, the Jews had neglected the house of God. They had neglected this good thing that God had called them to. Many of us do the same. Cleaning house requires us to stop neglecting the good that God has called us to. And and this seems so obvious, but let me explain to you why I think it's an important point to make. Um, So I used to work for Big Brothers Big Sisters, which is the mentoring agency. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, I would organize programs in school, and then I would recruit, um, help recruit uh, volunteers and mentors to basically be a big buddy with these younger kids. So middle school uh, down through second grade is what I worked with. And through that process, I had to go through a lot of training because we were working with kids that lived very difficult lives a lot of the time. And so one of the things that I learned for the first time in that particular training is the difference between abuse and neglect. They're not the same. Abuse is when you actively harm a child in some way. Neglect is when you don't take steps to prevent a child from being harmed. So, for example, neglect looks like not feeding the kid sufficiently or not making sure that they have warm clothes in the winter or not providing them with medical attention whenever they're really sick or ill to the point where they need to see a doctor. Things like that. So abuse is sort of the active harming and neglect is the sort of passive allowing them to be harmed by their circumstances. But what I want you to see is that whether it's abuse, actively doing wrong, or neglect, passively doing wrong, they're both destructive. They'll both ruin a kid's life. And I want you to see that in your walk with God, many of us have become very comfortable with the idea that as long as I don't do evil, that's the same thing as doing good, and I'm here to tell you that it's not. That is not a biblical idea, right? Not actively abusing the commands of God or doing things against the law of God is not the same as actively doing good and loving your neighbor. It's not the same. And so what some of us need to wake up to today as we're cleaning house in our own soul is that we've been doing a good job of avoiding the wrong things, but we failed at doing the right things. And so you need to self-examine and you need to think, what is the good that God has called me to in my life that I have neglected so far? Maybe it's helping people in need. You know, you've got everything that you need and more and you see that there's people in need and you have the ability and the opportunity to help them and what you do instead is what the religious people did in the story of the good samaritan and you get on the other side of the road from where people are hurting so that you can dodge and avoid those in need you shove the responsibility onto somebody else when god has called you to take responsibility for them maybe that's you And you need to step up your game there. Maybe, maybe the good that you've neglected in your life is sharing your faith. I was talking, uh, my connect group, we were were going through an apologetic series right now. And we were watching a video this week where we watched an atheist talk about how a, a Christian not evangelizing must hate the people in their life. An atheist said this. He said, if, if you are not evangelizing people and you believe that you have the key to eternal life and you're not evangelizing them, you must absolutely hate them to condemn them to hell by not preaching Jesus to them. That was convicting, man. 
Are you neglecting to share your faith? Maybe, maybe your neglect is simply devoting time to the Lord. Like, I know you're here right now, but I hope you don't only eat one meal a week and say, I'm satisfied. Church is the same way. We need to get our fill of Jesus, our fill of the scripture, our fill of time and prayer every single day in order to continue to walk well and strong in this Christian life. And so maybe you've neglected your devotional time. You've sort of had the attitude, I'll do it whenever I have time and whenever I think of it. And what you found so far in your life is that the answer to that is, it will never happen. Things never line up that way. You actually have to put a little box on your calendar and say, this is what this time is for because the Lord is that important to me. Cleaning house requires us to not just stop doing the good or stop doing the bad but stop neglecting the good fast forwarding a little bit i'm going to summarize uh, some of these verses brock so you're going to have to catch up with me in a second okay i want to keep things moving forward nehemiah also noticed that in those days in the land of judah on the Sabbath day, there were a lot of things that were going wrong. The Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest. It was supposed to be a day that was set aside uh, for holy rest, worship, and not work is the idea. And on the Sabbath, back in those days, Nehemiah said he noticed people were making wine. They were treading wine presses, so they were squishing grapes to make wine. They were working. He noticed that people were loading up grain and other goods on donkeys to bring into Jerusalem. And he noticed that people were selling fish and other merchandise in the city of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, which was strictly forbidden in the Old Testament law. In other words, they just absolutely were not treating the Sabbath as a holy day as God had commanded them to do. And this is what Nehemiah did about it. He says, I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you're doing? desecrating the Sabbath day. Do you notice, by the way, that Nehemiah starts with the leaders first? Do you realize that? He goes to the people who are most responsible and calls them out on this stuff. He says, didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, so this is how he handles it. He says, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was was over. He says, fine, you want to bring your carts and donkeys full of stuff into the city? We'll just close the gates. We'll lock the door. You can knock all you want. We're not coming in. It's like the the little uh, munchkin at Emerald City who just pokes his head out the door and just slams it in their face. That's what Nehemiah was. He's like, get out of here with that stuff. He says, I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. Pause. That's the NIV. I like the ESV better. He says, if you do that again, I will lay hands on you. Like, I'm going to throttle you, bro. Get out of here. Get away from the wall. So they were setting up a market outside, and he's like, listen, I am not just some schlub. I'm the governor here. You're going to get out of here, or we're going to have problems. From that time on, no surprise, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. What I want us to see here is that there is a difference between the commandment of God and the wisdom of Nehemiah. The commandment was keep the Sabbath day holy. But the people of Israel, their hearts were inclined to continue working, to not trust God, and to not take a day of rest. And so in applying the command to Israel, Nehemiah had to use his wisdom in order to get them to get caught up and to be obedient. So what's he do? He Um, He calls out the leaders, he closes the gates, he posts a guard, and he threatens those that will continue to try to sell. He uses wisdom in order to make sure that people don't cross that boundary marker that God had laid 
for them, which leads me to the next thing for you. Cleaning house means positioning yourself for greater faithfulness. Cleaning house means positioning yourself for greater faithfulness. My son, uh, who, as you know, for those of you that have been here, you know that immediately after service, I've been leaving like almost every week, and it's because my son was wrestling uh, all winter long, and his season ended last week uh, at the district tournament, and one of the things that happened at the end of the year is he got put in a weight class where he was facing kids that were three grades older than him. He's in third grade. He was wrestling sixth graders. They were five pounds heavier than him, much bigger and more athletic than he was. And so the first few times he wrestled in this weight class, he was getting kind of tossed around like a rag doll. Like he was going up and he was locking up with them and they were just muscling him around and it was not going well at all. And so what I realize is that I can't just tell him to go out there and try harder because it wasn't a question of effort. It was, a, it was a problem with him putting himself in a position to fail, and we need to, needed to adjust the tactic to where he wasn't locking up with these kids that were much older and stronger than he was. The same thing applies to our lives as Christians in that we need to realize our weaknesses and then position ourselves to succeed. So, for example, if you are someone who struggles with alcoholism, Now, in Movement Church, what we see in the scriptures and what I teach and what I believe is that drinking alcohol is not a sin. I drink alcohol from time to time, but I do it in moderation, and I'm not doing it to get drunk. Drunkenness is a sin, biblically speaking. You tracking with me? However, if you are someone who regularly struggles with getting drunk or there is alcoholism in your family and it becomes an issue for you, Guess what? I'm not going to invite you to hang out at the bar. And in fact, you need to set that hard line boundary for yourself so that you don't cross that line and dishonor God in the process. You tracking with me? How about this one? You're a single guy. And you get this girl. And you're both Christians and you're believers. But you also have human flesh. And she invites you over to the house late at night and there's no ill intentions, and you're not planning on sleeping with each other, but, you know, it's hard. Maybe the boundary you need to set up if you're going to struggle and you're not going to be able to keep your hands off of her is, hey, I'm just not going to come over right now. Let's, Let's meet up tomorrow for like a lunch date or something. Why? Because you realize that this is what God has called you to, is to purity, And so you say, you know what, instead of just saying, I'm going to go see her tonight, and I'm just going to try really, really hard to not do anything. No, know yourself. If you know yourself, you can set up those boundaries. That is wisdom that allows you to recognize that you don't always have to resist temptation or fight temptation. Sometimes you just need to avoid it altogether. It's wisdom. Now what I don't like to see is I don't like to see churches setting up those boundaries for you. In other words, believe it or not, I used to belong uh, sort of to a denomination that believed that Christians shouldn't dance because it could lead to other things, right? I'm not even kidding. That's true. Um, That's nonsense. Could it lead to other things? Sure, but so could waking up in the morning. My point is, Our job is not to impose those things on each other. We hold each other accountable to what the word of God says. But wisdom says, I know where my weaknesses are, and there's certain lines I'm not going to cross because I know I'm not going to be able to stop myself once I get to that point. Position yourself for success. On the flip side, you can position yourself for good habits as well. So, for example, if you stink at reading your Bible daily, but you drink coffee in the same chair every morning, guess where your Bible should be sitting? Next to the chair. Put it right there or put it on the chair so that you have to look at it before you flip on the TV. How about if you stink at prayer? How about you get in the habit of leaving the radio off so that you'll pray in the car on your frustrating drive to work? How about blocking off time in your schedule to serve and to worship? How about if you're bad about being generous, 
How about actually making it a part of your budget that, that you are going to give so much to whatever? And I'm not just talking about the church. I know people who have, okay, we're going to give this much to the church, but we also have this extra amount set aside to where anything that comes up during the year where there's a need, we can just meet it directly. And I love that. I think that's awesome. But they budget it. It's like car, utilities, generosity. They've got a line in there for it. They have positioned themselves to be faithful to God. So cleaning house means positioning yourself for greater faithfulness. And then this is the last thing for today. Uh, and this is from Nehemiah thirteen twenty three. It says, moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other people and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. They didn't know how to speak Hebrew. He says, I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. Now, let's pause here for a second. Uh, <laughs> Bible reading tip, all right? There are some things in the Bible that are descriptive, meaning they describe what happened, and there are other things in the Bible that are prescriptive, meaning they're telling you what you should do. This little incident is the first one. This is not saying that if you recognize that one of you is sinning or if that I recognize that one of you is in some sort of serious sin, that I can come to you, curse you, and pull out your hair, Right? I mean, that'd be hardcore, but I'm not going to do that, right? Because that's not what Jesus has called us to. However, it's descriptive. However, it goes to show the severity of what they have done. And you're like, what's the big deal? They just, they just married somebody from another place. What's the problem? Well, let's keep reading. He says, I made them take an oath in God's name and said, you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over Israel. But even he, even that guy, the wisest man to ever live, supposedly, was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are all doing this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? So what's the big deal? There's a couple things that are a big deal about this, about them marrying foreign women. Number one, God had told them not to. So plain and simple, it was disobedience. Okay, that's step number one. More than that, they had failed to recognize why God had told them not to. And it was very, very clear from the situation. First and foremost, he, he talks about Solomon and how Solomon married these foreign women who then led him and his heart into worshiping these other gods. In other words, the people of Israel were to recognize that if they were to get into uh, romantic relationships with people that were outside of their nation, this wasn't like a racist thing. This was a religious thing, recognizing that those people then influenced the hearts of the Jews away from their own God. Not only that, but to make things even worse, it's already, Nehemiah sees, affecting future generations of Jews. Because half of the kids of these relationships don't even speak Hebrew, which means more likely than not, they're being raised to worship the gods of the foreigners rather than the God of Israel. They're not hearing the law of God in their native language. And so future generations of Israel are already being corrupted because of the disobedience. In other words, one compromise very easily leads to another, which leads to another. And it just brings sort of this decay into their lives. The last one for you is cleaning house means remembering that there's always a cost to compromise. There's always a cost to compromise. I think one thing we need to remember, I know there's like a lot of harsh things here, and it's supposed to be a frustrating chapter to read because it was frustrating for Nehemiah, and I think we need to feel his frustration that they started off so good and that after some time, they just got content living in their mess. But one of the things that we need to 
sort of rediscover as Christians is that when God commands it, he doesn't command it simply to inconvenience you. He does it because it's for your good. You hear me? There are things, actually Connor was talking about this a few weeks ago to some of the teens in the exchange. There were some laws in the Old Testament that seemed just weird. And certainly at the time, they just seemed so strange. But now here we are thousands of years later and we see that there's all kinds of health benefits to the things that God had commanded that seemed like really foolish, silly things at the time. Why? Because God knows what's best for you. Why? Because he created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. But as long as we continue to compromise, we're going to have to continue to discover, and the hard way, the cost of it. The book of Nehemiah ends this way. He discovers that the priesthood has been defiled too. The high priest's grandson is married to the daughter of one of their enemies. He drives that man off. He purifies the priests and the Levites. He makes sure everybody has a job to perform so that the temple runs smoothly from now on. He makes provisions for them to continue offering sacrifices and worship to God. And then in verse 31, he just finishes the book. This is the end of the book of Nehemiah with this. He says, remember me with favor, my God. It's not really the way that we want it to end. It ends on a bit of a sour note. Because we get this sense that once Nehemiah is gone, that they're just going to go back to their old ways. It's kind of bitter, in a sense. A couple quick thoughts as we wrap up this series. The first thing is over and over again you notice that God, or or that Nehemiah was asking that God would remember him. And I just want to share with some of you that, that if you are a believer and you have been laboring faithfully sharing with other people or serving in some way and you feel unnoticed by the people around you. You feel like your boss doesn't see you. You feel like your family doesn't appreciate you. Maybe, maybe, I hope not, but maybe you feel like your church doesn't appreciate you at times. I want you to know that God sees everything you've done and not a single thing that you've done for the Lord has been done in vain. Not one. You know how I know that? Because there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians that says nothing that we do for the Lord is ever done in vain. God sees you, and even if he hasn't rewarded you yet, he will reward you in the end. In Hebrews chapter 6, we're also told that God will not forget the work that we've done for him, that the love that we've shown for him will not be forgotten as we help his people. So the people themselves may not be grateful for you, but let me tell you, God sees what you've done. He will not forget, and that's good news. Secondly, I think that there's a call here for us to take up Nehemiah's mantle. In his absence, who is going to step up and live faithfully for God and lead faithfully for God. Who's going to do it in the church? Who's going to do it in your family? Who's going to do it in your workplace? God is calling you to step into his shoes and to be the example, to resist compromise, to live faithfully trusting the Lord in everything that you do. And then lastly, the book ends on sort of this dissatisfying note for a reason. In fact, if you read through the Old Testament, you'll notice that oftentimes the books of the Old Testament leave sort of in an unsettling way. It seems like they're going to end on a high note and then it goes back down. And one of the reasons for this, I believe, is because the Old Testament is meant to point everyone to Jesus as the ultimate answer. Let me explain. Nehemiah He did all of these reforms, but it was primarily outward. He he came in as a governor with authority, and he made all of these outward changes to their behavior because that's what the law commanded them to do. But the reason over and over again they would settle back into compromise is because even though they had the commands, which were good, they did not have changed hearts 
that they were still broken and wicked and untransformed in their hearts. And so the second that somebody wasn't watching them and babysitting them, they began to go back down the wrong trails that they used to go to. They began to go wayward away from what God had called them to. And so the only answer to this ultimately is not to give you a list of rules to fix you and to tell you how you should spend your time, but rather for Jesus to come in and to change your heart entirely to give you a new love for God, to give you new desires on top of your salvation. Romans chapter 8 summarizes it this way. Paul says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and a perfect one at that. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words... You on your own can never, even with a law in front of you, can be good enough to live up to its standards fully. That we all fall short of the glory of God. That God's wrath is something that is is not like singling out the worst of us, but that the best of us are undeserving of God's grace. But there was one person in human history that lived perfectly, fulfilling that law to a T, and that was Jesus Christ. And that one person, this is, hold on, I'm not done, you wait, you wait. That one person, Jesus Christ, not only lived that law perfectly, but rather than coming down and saying, this is easy, get on my level, he came all the way down to your level. In fact, when he died on the cross, He died not for his sins, but rather he died for yours as a perfect sacrifice. And now as a result, all who will put their faith in him, sincerely put their faith in him, can not only be saved from the penalty of sin, which is death, but from the power of sin in their lives as well. Which means we can actually choose God for the first time ever because of Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand? Let's get ready to pray. Let's pray together. If you could bow your heads and close your eyes. I just want to take a moment and just acknowledge the fact that some of you are Christians that have been around for a while. And as we're talking about cleaning house, you realize that maybe in a lot of ways you're like the people of Israel who, who though they had sort of this established relationship with God, they've fallen back into old ways and old compromises and God is calling you to not ignore those things any longer and there's something specific in your life that God is prompting you in your heart right now in this moment to deal with it to give over to him to let him transform and to let him show you his goodness in that thing that you didn't previously want to hand over to him If that describes you, I want to take a moment to pray for you. So would you just put your hand up in the air? I see you guys. Praise God. Me too. While your hands are up, I want to also take this opportunity to extend an invitation to the person here today who came in the room not having a relationship with God. Up to this point, you thought it was about you being good on your own and that God would accept that, but you just heard me say that all have fallen short of God's standard. And you're realizing now that you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ in order to have a relationship with the Father, in order to be forgiven and to have eternal life. And I want you to know that you don't have to work for that. In fact, it's not something that you can earn. It's a gift that God has extended to you And you can receive it by faith, by simply trusting in this Jesus who lived and died and rose for you. And so if you're somebody here this morning who says, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus, would you also put your hand up so we can pray for you? I see you, brother.
Anybody else? Praise God. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege of conviction. <laughs> God, we know your word says that you discipline those that you love. Like a father corrects a wayward child to protect them and to help them in their life. You're a loving father who, though you often have hard words for us, they're meant to be understood in the context of the image that you've placed in us. That you love us, that you value us, that you don't want any of us to perish. Lord, I pray right now for the believers that said this morning that they've kind of need to clean house a little bit. I pray that you would give them clarity not only on what it is that they need to clean, clean up with your help, but also uh, that you would give them a clear path action steps and and the motivation beyond this morning to do it it's so easy in the course of the the week to just kind of fade back and forget what we've talked about and committed to on sunday but god i pray that this would be a a pivot a turning point for them in their walk with you that this would be the the point where they turn to greater faithfulness in their pursuit of you and lord i just pray for for this this man that said, I need to put my faith in Jesus this morning. I pray that that faith would be deep and abiding. I pray that he, he, he doesn't even know. Lord, I pray that you would teach him about just the endlessness of your love for him. That as he begins to understand himself and his own sin more, that he would realize that it also shows how great your love is for him and for this world. I pray that you would help him to get off to a strong start walking with you that he would seek out people who can help him in this new walk in his life, and that he would discover that even though your way is hard, it is the most worth it because it has eternal value. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would bless this remaining worship and that we would sing to you from our whole hearts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's sing together. Come calling my name My God is so much bigger Than troubles I face Why would I hunger For power or riches or fame My God is so much better than all of these things. So I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful. His promise is true. So I'll speak to the mountains, oh, it's time to move, because my God is bigger, better, stronger, greater than you, and my enemies scatter, because they know the battle is done. My God is stronger, the victory is already won. Yeah, he died for my ransom, and he rose up on the third day. My God is greater than death. I won't be shaken, I 
won't be moved Cause my God is faithful His promise is true So I'll speak to the mountains Oh, it's time to move Cause my God is bigger better, stronger, greater than you. There's no mountain too high, no valley too low. There's no fear that I have, he doesn't already know. There's no problem too big, there's no weapon too strong. There is nothing for God that's impossible. There's no mountain too high, no valley too low. There's no fear that I have, he doesn't already know. There's no problem too big, there's no weapon too strong. There is nothing for God that's impossible. And I won't be shaken, no I won't be moved cause my God is faithful his promise is true so I'll speak to the mountains tell them it's time to move cause my God is bigger better stronger greater 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 than you All right, church. Well, you've got your marching orders for the week. A couple things really quick. Uh, if you need to give, don't forget to. Don't forget to uh, stop by Connect Central if you haven't yet, especially if you're a first-time guest. Also, don't forget, we're going to see each other for worship night on Saturday, so make sure you plan on being here. Invite a friend. It's going to be awesome. That's it. Love you guys. Have a great week. Thanks.